The Rising of the Shield Hero. Wow, what an amazing anime series. I've only seen a few Isekai series and thoroughly enjoyed even fewer of them. But each one is very different and despite sharing the same genre, they're really hard to compare. Kanasuba is a comedy series. <laughs> that time I got reincarnated as a slime is a relaxing and easygoing fantasy series and so on and so forth. Wow. The Rising of the Shield Hero is more of a dark fantasy and leans more on a more dramatic and emotional story. Actually, that's probably an understatement. Suffice it to say that this anime was probably one of the most cathartic pieces of media I've ever consumed. And yes, the emotions I felt probably rivals even this scene. With an easily relatable protagonist supported by a lovable cast and an engaging plot set in a fantasy world, The Rising of the Shield Hero sets the bar high for a great isekai. I'd give it an almost perfect score of 9.5. But this video isn't about my review of the anime. I actually want to talk about the protagonist, Naofumi, and the nature versus nurture debate. It's not a prominent theme, but it was something that I couldn't stop thinking about throughout the course of the anime series. So what is nature versus nurture? It's a debate whether human behavior is determined by a person's environment and experiences or a person's genes. In layman's terms, are we who we are because that's how we are at birth, or were we shaped this way because of what happened in our lives? From the beginning, we see that Nafumi is a kind, positive, and trusting person. He has prevented his brother from joining the wrong crowd, and so we know that he has a good moral compass and is perhaps even a reliable person. Upon being summoned to Malramark alongside with the other three heroes, Naofumi was the only one who was willing to hear out the mages who had summoned them. The other three heroes immediately asked for compensation should they help defend their world from the waves of calamity and try to squeeze out as much as they can as heroes, even threatening to become their enemy if they're not properly accommodated for. I think that this is an important discrepancy between their characters. While Nafumi is more selfless and willing to help out strangers, the other three think of how they can benefit from it first. He was also more enthusiastic about the situation, unlike the other three whose first instinct was to take advantage of the situation. It is clear at this point that Naofumi is a kinder and more selfless person than the other three heroes. They each get their own weapons and become the sword hero, the spear hero, the bow hero, and the shield hero. And while Naofumi is stuck with the shield, which is apparently the short end of the stick, he takes it in stride and decides to make the best out of it. Okay, maybe he doesn't take it as well at first, but he does learn how to deal with it. Anyways, when he parties up with Mayin, he treats her like a proper party member and was even willing to spend a good amount of his money for her armor upgrades. So far, he seems like a typical altruistic hero protagonist in a fantasy setting. And he is. I believe that in his nature, he is an honorable and forward-looking character, a good person who will help people in need as a hero should. However, his personality takes a complete 180 after being framed as a rapist and is thrown to the bottom of society, hated by everyone in Malramark and even stripped of his equipment and money with the exception of his shield. <laughs> He becomes scornful at the world he'd been summoned to, angry that he was brought here against his will only to have injustice done to him. He loses faith in everyone and is unable to trust anyone unless he formed a slave contract with them. This is where the nurture part comes in. He is an example of failed nurturing, being treated unjustly by society for no reason other than the fact that he is the shield hero. This experience turns him into a cynic, which is in complete contrast to how he naturally was. However, despite this, he still performs his role as one of the four heroes by continuing to level up and become powerful enough to help defend the village of Ryute, while the other three heroes simply attack the monsters from the waves with no consideration of protecting the undefended. That isn't to say that Nafumi is still the typical selfless hero we would have been led to believe he'd become. Throughout the series, he shows his selfish side as he constantly helps others while clearly expecting and demanding rewards from them. In one perfect line, he even outright says that he doesn't consider himself a hero and just a person who can sell his abilities and labor. 
なんと感謝の言葉を述べてよいのか感謝はいらない欲しいのは金だ銀貨500枚でいい500枚高すぎます危険手当も込みだ国へ払うつもりだった依頼料を回せばいいだろう成人じゃなくてただの主戦のじゃなやめなさい自分で成人と名乗った覚えはない Even though he seemingly only seeks out a reward, he still helps others and compromises when they cannot fully compensate him for his work. This is because Nafumi still truly believes in helping others and that it is his duty as a hero to protect the common folk. If he hadn't been framed and set up by Mayan and the king, he likely would still be going on these quests and helping villages, but in a more optimistic and friendly manner. He likely still accept rewards, but just wouldn't be as forthcoming as he is. After all, he does need to provide for Raftalia and Philo. But the way he is now, he always demands a reward, but never squeezes out others for every last drop, like the American education system. Despite his nurture making him out to be a terrible person and a villain, his nature says otherwise that he is truly a hero and that he can still become attached to others, which will actually be my next point. <laughs> After repelling the first wave and during the event to celebrate the heroes' success, Motoyasu challenges Nafumi to a duel in order to have Raftalia's slave crest removed. During the duel, Nafumi uses dirty tricks such as concealing low level mobs in his attire to use his weapons against Motoyasu. From a logical standpoint, it makes sense to do this since, as the shield hero, he has little to no offensive capabilities and must rely on others to be his weapon. However, he still presents himself as a villain because his nurture tells him that he will always be a lowly scum in the eyes of society, and so he plays the part. He gains the upper hand, but after an illegal intervention by Mine, Nafumi loses a duel and Raftalia's slave crest is removed. This almost completely breaks Nafumi to the point where he unlocks the Curse Shield series. The fact that Nafumi had such a violent and emotional reaction to losing Raftalia holds great meaning. Even though Nafumi believes himself to be a villain who must rely on underhanded tactics and questionably moral actions to get by, and though he has led himself to believe that no one else matters to him and that he can't rely on anyone but himself or his slave, he is emotionally destroyed at the thought of losing Raftalia. If Nafumi really was all those things, a scoundrel, a criminal, or a villain, he would not really have cared about losing Raftalia as he could just as easily acquire a new slave to replace her. But he has grown attached to her and even sees her as a daughter, that despite leveling up and becoming an adult, Raftalia still remains a little girl through Nafumi's eyes. Because of his past experience of being betrayed and losing his trust in others, he has come only to trust the slave crest that was on Raftalia. He believed that losing Raftalia's slave crest meant that she would now willingly abandon him, just like how Mine betrayed him, just like how the other heroes quickly disregarded him, just like how the entirety of society abandoned him. And that thought broke him in a way similar to a loving father losing his daughter. He was like a father, he raised and cared for Raftalia properly. Now Fumi can tell himself that he does not care for anyone else in this world and that he will use any means to get by, a result of his nurture from this world, but it is in his nature to be a good person who is capable of affection. It meant a great deal to him to believe that he would lose Raftalia, the only other person he was able to form a connection with, even if he believed it to be simply because of the slave crest. This is even evident back when Raftalia was still a child and he had first started training her. He was never abusive and fed her properly and only used a slave crest so that she may learn how to fight, motivating her by telling her that the two of them can get stronger so that no other demi-human children will ever go through what she did. Now fast forward to that one cathartic episode. After many instances of being shunned by society and several efforts from mine to bring him down further and even framing him for kidnapping Princess Melty, 
from being denied access to a class upgrade to being forced into a duel that would be a detriment to him, Nafumi had stood strong throughout it all using the powers he worked so hard to attain, and with his lolly harem. As the queen finally enters the picture, karma finally catches up. After all of the injustice done to Nafumi, the king and mine are put to trial and their schemes and mistreatment towards the shield hero are put to light. Everything from Mine's false rape accusation to the king's bias against and spitefulness towards the shield hero are finally exposed to all of Malramark. Public opinion towards the shield hero immediately takes a 180 in what is perhaps the greatest cathartic scene I've ever watched so far, as I have mentioned. This episode serves as a release of all the bottled up emotions and tension that we as an audience have built up over the course of 20 episodes. When the trial ends and Mine and the King are sentenced to death, it would be perfectly normal to believe that they deserved it, and that the audience would also enjoy seeing such villains that committed great acts of treason that aim to benefit them and not the country they served get their just desserts. I mean, it's definitely as exciting as the festival. But right before the guillotine is dropped, Mine begs for help. She turns to Motoyasu, the man she manipulated and went on adventures with, and he turns her away, submitting her to the queen's punishment. But when Mine tearfully begs Nafumi for help, <laughs> Nafumi intervenes and spares their lives, proving once again that he is the better person. <laughs> I mean, he does have their names legally changed to Trash and Bitch, with Mine's adventurer name being changed to Slut, so it was still kind of pretty satisfying in my opinion. Even though this episode may have disappointed audience members who wanted nothing more than to see Trash and Slut executed for their actions, Nafumi himself believes that seeing their heads in a basket would not bring him closure. Because in his nature, he is not a spiteful and malicious person. He is capable of showing mercy to the people who have made his life a living hell. This is foreshadowed even back when Raftalia came face to face with the lord who tortured and abused her and sold her off to a slave trader. Nafumi wanted her to spare his life because he didn't want Raftalia to become the kind of person who murders regardless of the actions of that individual. Nafumi is an example of his nature overcoming his nurture. Or is he? There is one scene that does contradict the point I've been making, and it's once again back during the duel between Nafumi and Motoyasu. When Nafumi believes that Raftalia has been taken away from him and has given up hope on this world, in his own words, <laughs> it was only after Raftalia comforted him and assured him of her belief in him that Nafumi's anger dissipated. So perhaps it was actually Raftalia's nurture that Naofumi still carried out his duties as a hero who helped others. It was only after Raftalia comforted him and assured him of her belief in him that Naofumi's anger dissipated. Because Raftalia gave Nafumi the one thing he was looking for, a companion who would believe in him, he was able to carry on after the mistreatment he received from the king and Maini. It's not only in Nafumi's nature to be a good person, but also a result of Raftalia and her nurturing that influenced him. Would Nafumi still be the kind of hero he is without Raftalia? Would he be the kind of hero who still helps others without abusing his power or being unreasonably greedy? I like to think that yes, he would be. This is of course based on his personality at the beginning of the series when he was summoned to this world, but in the end, it could still be argued. So, in conclusion, The Rising of the Shield Hero showcases a great example of the nature versus nurture debate by introducing an enthusiastic, kind-hearted hero into a fantasy world and bringing him down to the bottom of society through unfair hardships and prejudiced motives. Despite his nurture attempting to turn him into a villain, Nafumi proves himself to be above all that. 
It's one of the main reasons I like this anime because it subverts the accidental hero type and turns the protagonist into an anti-hero that the audience can be sympathetic towards. It is definitely a different take from the isekai genre, though I myself have only seen Konosuba, which is pretty good. <laughs> Sword Art Online, which to be honest, I don't even remember if I finished watching that or not. Log Horizon, and that time I got reincarnated as a slime, as far as I can remember. Wow. I'm looking forward to seasons 2 and 3, especially since Nafumi finally got together with Raccoon Waifu. Pretty sure she's legal, but please don't loot her. And because seeing him endure everything he went through made him into a compelling protagonist. A protagonist who is by nature, a true hero. I got it.